thank you uh, for inviting me. It's really nice to, to be here. Um, so yes, as, as uh, Rita said, I'm going to um, introduce conversation analysis. Um, I've been working in conversation analysis for a long time now, about uh, 25 years maybe. Um, and as Ritesh said, my, a lot of my latest research has been on laughter, uh, but I also have looked at a number of other things. Um, so for example, I have done work on reported speech, uh, quotation, um, and um, expressions like uh, cliched figurative expressions, idioms, those sorts of things, those fixed expressions. Uh, I started off looking at those. Um, and I've done um, work on other, other things like death announcements, for example. Um, so I've spent, uh, as I say, many years now um, analyzing conversation, um, both informal conversation, like telephone calls, for example, um, and also uh, institutional talk as well, such as calls to um, call centres. Uh, I have a large collection of calls to uh, a call centre um, in Britain, but um, it's a gas supply company, um, and I've worked on those as well. So I've, I've worked on, on both um, institutional and uh, informal talk. Um, if we get a chance today, we might look at some of the institutional talk, call centre calls, but I'll put that very at the very end, um, and we'll, we'll see if we get onto that. But mostly today, I will be concentrating on informal talk, um, because many conversation analysts believe that you start with conversation, you start with informal talk, and then you use what you learn about informal talk to study other types of talk like courtrooms or news interviews or job interviews or doctor-patient interaction, all those kinds of institutional or media talk can be studied once you have the basics from informal talk. So what I'd like to do today, uh, can, you, can you all hear me okay? Is it, can you hear all right? I don't, no, uh, yeah, yes, you can, he you can hear all right at the back, yeah. Um, shout if you don't if you don't hear me, <coughs> then tell me. Um, I don't know if there's a mic. No, 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 no. Okay, so just tell me if, if uh, you can't hear me. Um, so what I'd like to do today, <coughs> excuse me, is um, I've tried to do two things really um, to introduce conversation analysis and tell you a little bit about what it involves, give you some examples about how to use conversation analysis. What I'd like to do is just show you how it's possible to study interaction, um, what you might learn from interaction. So I'm hoping to give you some examples uh, to illustrate using conversation analysis. The other thing that I thought would be useful today is to just using some of the findings of conversation analysis to introduce some basic fundamental aspects of interaction. So to tell you some of the very basic um, aspects of interaction that conversation analysis has, has shown us. Okay, so one of the things obviously I need to do is to, um, to work out kind of um, if you have any um, background in conversation analysis or if it's very new to you. So tell me if I'm going too fast, if, I'm, um, if you're not understanding me correctly, please tell me and let me know and I can adjust what I do accordingly. Um, so who, who here has already done some conversation? I'll put your hand up if you already have a little bit of uh, knowledge about conversation analysis. <laughs> yes, a few people. Good, good, okay. Um, so as I say, let me know if I'm going too fast or uh, it's, it's uh, too, 
um, difficult to, to understand. Um, just tell me. Okay. Okay. So um, what we have here, you should all have uh, this booklet, and this is basically what we're going to go through. Everyone has a copy of this. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to work our way through this today. I can change things if we need to, we can adjust it, but this is the program I put together as a, um, a starting point. Hopefully, this will work out, but as I say, I can always adjust things and do it a little bit differently if there's a need. What I'm hoping today is that there will be a mixture of I will talk to you some of the time, um, but I, obviously this is a workshop, so I'm hoping that um, everyone will have a chance to talk, and that um, you will, what I will do today is give you plenty of chance to study some examples of interaction, and to do some practical analysis. Conversation analysis is very, very practical. Um, it, is very much about working on examples of interaction, listening to the sound file, listening to the sound, having a transcript, studying the transcript, and studying it in very much detail, um, and, and hopefully working with several examples, and um, really trying to, to, to get to grips, to learn about the basics of interaction. So it's a very practical uh, subject. Um, we do lots of analysis, lots and lots of analysis. Um, so that's what I would like to, to do today, and I hope you will enjoy doing some analysis. Um, we have, in the booklet you will see, we have lots of uh, Lots of examples, such as this. Um, now, you will see it's transcribed in a particular way. You may not be familiar with this way of transcribing. We have a key um, here on the back of the first page. There is a key to the transcriptions. But I'm hoping you won't need to kind of rely on this too much because I have the sound files for all of the the extracts, so you will be able to hear them. Um, I've listened to the, the sound quality is a little bit fuzzy, so I hope you will be able to, to understand it okay. It's always difficult, I know, because when you are not used to he hearing the sound, hearing the calls, it can take quite a few minutes to get used to them, and they go so quickly uh, when you hear a call, you know, it's just goes so quickly. So I will play things several times and hopefully you will be able to follow on the transcript and get an idea of how they are, how they sound. Okay, so, um, so yes, so um, as I say, what I would like to do is a mixture of me talking to you a little bit, but also lots of analysis, lots of talking as a group too. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is start with a bit of an introduction to conversation analysis. Um, so, conversation analysis um, came into being uh, in about the 60s, 1960s in um, America, in Los Angeles. Um, Harvey Sachs, have you all heard of Harvey Sachs? Yes, good. Harvey Sachs was working at the University of Los Angeles. And um, he was working on um, calls to um, a suicide prevention centre. Um, somewhere people would ring up if they were very unhappy, very depressed, they would ring up this call centre. And he wanted to know, um, well, it was a problem for the call centre. How do you get people to give their names? Because often people would not give their names, they wanted to remain anonymous. And the call centre wanted to know 
when can you tell that someone is not going to give their name? How early in the call can you tell that they don't want to give their name? And he, um, he found that there were various, um, can you see this okay? So people would ring the call centre and the person at the call centre would pick up and say something like, hello, this is Mr Brown. And in some cases, people who were ringing the call centre would say something like this. Instead of giving their name, they would say, I can't hear you. Okay. So obviously this is the slot where people can give their name. They can say, oh, oh hello, this is Mr Smith. But he noticed that people would sometimes avoid giving their name by saying something like, I can't hear you. And he, um, he talked to a colleague of his, um, Manny Shegloff, who still works at the um, University of California um, at Los Angeles. He's just, just retired, but he's still, he's still there. And um, he, so Sachs and Shegloff went for a walk and Sachs was saying, um, is it possible that people are using this method of really getting, uh, avoiding the chance to give their name? Is it possible that they're saying, I can't hear you, as a way of not giving their name? And it seems quite obvious to us now, but it was a very different time then in the in 1960s, um, linguists did not tend to look at uh, interaction, um, and Sachs was a sociologist. In fact, um, people were not studying interaction in, in a lot of detail. Um, it was believed by many people to be quite haphazard, quite messy, full of mistakes, full of pauses and hesitation, and not very structured. And so it, this was something, a new idea that Sachs came up with that actually is, this is very clever, this is very well designed. What he realised was that there is a slot for giving your name here. That inter, uh, terms that talk can be seen as slots for doing certain actions. So. In this slot, you should give your name. But they don't want to give their name, so they come up with another strategy to avoid giving their name. So, there are various implications of this. One is that he realised that terms are very closely tied together. So, saying, this is Mr Brown here, that means that in the next turn, you should give your name. So turns, there is a very close connection between turns and the action of this turn creates a slot for doing a particular thing, a particular action in this turn. So B cannot choose whatever he wants to do there. Um, he has to deal with this question, he you know, this opportunity to give his name and there are various ways in which he can deal with it. But the tying mechanisms mean that he has to orient to this term. Okay. So Sachs realized from this that conversation is actually very closely, very tightly designed. It's very, very highly structured, very tightly designed. Um, it's not haphazard, it's not messy, it's actually um, designed in minute detail, patterned in minute detail, 
And if it's patterned in minute detail, then that means we can study it in minute detail. We can look for those patterns. And that is really what conversation analysis is. It's all about looking for those patterns, those structures that underpin the way we talk, the way we construct interaction. So two things that are very important to um, to conversation analysis that I hope to illustrate is um, structure um, and design. So conversation analysis is all about looking for the structure, the way that the conversations are put together. And part of this is looking at um, sequence. that what we do is we look at not individual terms, we don't extract you know, small sections of talk, we look at large sequences to look at how they're structured, to look at how terms are tied together, the actions that are done in those terms. Um, and therefore we look at how terms are designed. So you can look at each turn, the way it's designed, and an important part of that is it's designed, the they're designed to do actions. RC 117, key recharge, So we look at um, how turns are designed to perform actions and how these fit together into these sequences. So you can look at things like how how openings are done, how stories are done, how uh, troubles tellings are done, how closings are done. You can look at these sequences in talk. So what that tells us is about, as I say, Sachs was a, a sociologist and he wanted to study society. He wasn't in the first place interested in language. He just wanted to study society, but he wanted to study it in minute detail. Not the big structures like power and class. He wanted to look at the minute, uh, everyday details of, of society and how society is constructed at a minute level. So he wanted to know how, how we construct interactions, how we do things, how we interact, how we, how we create society through these interactions on a day-by-day day day basis. And he realised that, uh, that interaction was a very good way of studying society because you could get recordings and you could listen to those recordings over and over again. He wanted to do very detailed analysis. And you could play those recordings to other people and then other people could say, yes, I agree with your analysis, or no, I disagree with your analysis, or no, I have a different approach to your analysis. So he wanted it to be quite scientific, so that people could, could check, could, could go over his analysis and see if they agreed with it. So one thing that's very important in conversation analysis is providing the data is spelling out your analysis, showing examples, so that readers of journal articles, books, can say, yes, I agree with that analysis, or no, I disagree with that analysis. Okay, so, um, so these are basic features of, of conversation analysis and basic features of interaction, in fact. Um, so conversation analysis is not interested in what's going on in people's heads. It's not psychological. It's, it's not about looking for um, linking what we do in talk to our mental states, like saying, you know, she's nervous, therefore she's laughing or whatever. It's not about um, trying to get inside people's heads. It's about studying interaction to look at the patterns 
So the speakers in, in cognitive analysis are maybe less important who the speakers are, etc., is less important perhaps than in, say, sociolinguistics, for example. So that's what we're doing. That's, so that's a basic introduction, very quick introduction to conversation analysis. Um, so I hope that's useful. Is that useful? Is that okay? Um, and hopefully you don't necessarily uh, know that or, or already. Hopefully it's uh, new information for some of you at least. Um, okay, so um, one of the things, uh, as I say, what I would like to do is um, introduce some basic elements of interaction to start off with, and then later on I will give you more of a chance to analyse some data. So, one of the, uh, obviously, one of the most fundamental aspects of interaction is turn-taking, the turn-taking system. It's the turn-taking system that I think is very much responsible for the way interaction works, for the kinds of turns we have. So, for example, we will see that um, our turn-taking system and the way we design turns tends to result in usually quite small turns. Obviously not somewhere like today when I'm taking a very, very, very long turn. <laughs> um, but often in con normal conversation, usually quite small turns. It's backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. It's not, you know, one speaker... Um, speaking for many minutes and then the other speaker speaking. It's very much backwards and forwards. And that is partly a product, I think, of both the turn-taking system and the way that we design those turns. So the turn-taking system is very, very important. It's also important for uh, looking at other types of interaction because what we see often in more formal talk institutional talk is ad adaptations to the turn-taking system. So our turn-taking, the turn-taking system in those situations is changed slightly and that gives a different flavour to the talk. So for example in doctor-patient interaction, you know that the doctor begins the conversation, asks questions, the patient answers the questions, the doctor closes the conversation. So the turn-taking system and the actions that are done in, in the turns are rather different. And that gives doctor-patient interaction the nature it, it has. So we see that there is a particular turn-taking system for informal conversational talk. And that can be altered in other situations. Again, if you think of courtroom trials, the turn-taking system is very different. And again, that lends it a particular kind of flavour, very formal, very structured. That is different from informal talk. But it's the adaptation of that turn-taking system. OK, so, um, so I thought it might be useful to go through um, turn-taking and the way turns are constructed. Does that sound a useful place to begin? Yeah, great. Okay, so um, so I've given some information here, uh, which uh, you can read, and I will, I will go through some of it, uh, and then we will look at some um, examples. Okay, so this um, there was a very early paper by uh, Sachs, Shegelf, and Jefferson on turn taking, very influential paper. And so a lot of this information comes from, from that paper uh, and from Sachs's lectures that he has published lectures um, that you can read and um, he was interested in turn taking them there. And so Sachs um, observed that um, normally in conversation we have one, one person speaking at a time. Um, and um, there is not very much gap between turns, and there is not 
a great deal of overlap. Since Sachs was writing, conversation analysts have looked at the gap, the normal gap between terms, and it is tiny. It is, I think it's 0 0.005 of a second, the normal gap. It's very, very small. So you, that's how long it takes you to realize that someone is, talk, is finished talking and to, to start, to begin your turn. So we are experts, we are all experts at working out when the other person's turn is coming to an end and that it is our chance to speak. Okay, so, so interaction, in interaction there is very little gap, very little overlap. But that's quite a puzzle, <coughs> me. because we don't plan it out beforehand. Uh, we don't know who's going to speak when. We do it on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We negotiate the turn-taking system on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So the fact that it works out so smoothly is uh, a puzzle because it is, it is very, uh, very clever, very sophisticated. Um, so, Sachs and Chegloff were interested in, Sachs, Chegloff and Jefferson were interested in how do we manage this? Um, I was going to say, have you, have you had the experience of talking, uh, say, on Skype or something, or on the phone where there is a, a time delay? Yes, yeah, yeah. And how does it, um, how does it affect, affect your talk? How, do, how does it feel when you have the time delay? Sometimes both of you respond at the same time. Yeah, yes. we'll talk on the Skype and Gmail, mm -hmm. that's just what happens. We wait for your turn and another person is also waiting for the turn and all of a sudden both of you start speaking yes. at a time. Yes. That creates confusion. Yes. Yes, that's right, yes, exactly, because you take a turn, there you wait, there's no immediate uptake, so then you take another turn, but the other person starts to talk at the same time. Because what you're noticing there is that there's, there's a little gap, and you're not, you know, that, that's a problem, so you try and overcome that problem by taking another turn, but also they talk. Um, and how does it feel? Um, can can you have good conversations on Skype when there's a time delay? How does it feel? No. No. <laughs> so it's not. It feels awkward, doesn't it? It's difficult to, to have a good conversation. Um, so those little tiny gaps, and it and it can be very very small but they are enough to make us feel quite awkward, quite uh, uncomfortable, uh, and it's very difficult to get a really nice flowing conversation going. So that shows, I think, just how, how we are used to such precision timing. And we manage in a, a, a very sophisticated system involving precision timing when we um, can talk normally. And anything like even a maybe a tenth of a second gap can, can make that feel very strange. So uh, there's a puzzle, how do we manage the turn-taking system so well? So Saxon, Shegloff and Jefferson began by trying to describe some of the fundamental features of the turn-taking system and um, they began with things that are, are quite obvious, but it was a good place to, to begin. Um, so I've given some of those things here. When, when overlap occurs, it's brief. The order and dis distribution of terms is not fixed, but varies from within and between conversations. Uh, the size and length of terms varies from one to the next. The particip what participants say in their terms or what actions they prefer is not restricted or specified in advance, unlike in, say, courtroom trials or something like that. And speaker change occurs. So uh, this is describing this very sophisticated system, but it's not planned ahead of time. It's very, um, very much negotiated moment by moment. 
<coughs> and so, um, I said that, so defining feature of conversation is that it involves at least two participants taking turns, and you, you get this A, B, A, B, A, B um, pattern, and as I say, it tends to be, in most situations, turns tend to be quite short, so you get very frequent changes, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. <coughs> um, and I've said there that um, you know often less Levinson frames that less of, less than five percent of talk is is in overlap and yet gaps are quite unusual as well. And if gaps do a, appear, they tend to be uh, very small um, because longer longer gaps are are um, are significant in that if, if you say you know um, do you want a cup of tea? And there's a long gap, then you you take it that <laughs> no, you don't want to put it in. So a long gap, even just up to a second, a second would be enough to say no. It's not going to be a yes answer. It's going to be a no answer. So a a, sa a pause of just a second is significant. Uh, and that's not the same in all cultures. For example, in Inuit languages. Um, it is okay to have long, long gaps, up to maybe 15 minutes. So you can say, do you, do you want a cup of tea? And then 15 minutes later, you can say, yes, please. And that is uh, perfectly acceptable. So some of these things are not necessarily universal. The turn-taking system itself is not completely universal because um, Shegloff talks about uh, um, a, a tribe in, um, I think it's South America, where, um, they talk in order of uh, the hierarchy, so the chief talks first and then the next one down and then the next one down and then the next one down. So it's not always um, the same across the world. Um, there are some slight variations to it, but obviously it is pre pretty much uh, universal. Um, <coughs> So Saxon Shegloff uh, began, <coughs> sorry, Saxon Shegloff and Jefferson began by trying to, first of all, identify how turns are taken, how we change from one turn to an next turn. And they identified three ways this can happen. So a current speaker can select a next speaker. So if you ask a question of a particular person, maybe you use their name, then you can select a next speaker and you can ask, a, say, you ask a question with their name and then you wait for them to answer. Or a speaker can self-select, so you say something, you finish, and they say something. Or the present speaker can continue. So you say something, and then you say another thing, and then you say another thing, like I am today. <laughs> um, so a very, very long turn. Um, lots of um, bits to the turn, lots, lots of sections to it. Um, and um, Sachs, Chekhov and Jefferson say that these are hierarchically organised with first, um, other selection first and same speaker continuation last. And because the system is locally managed and interactionally controlled, it works again and again at each possible completion point. So, the big question becomes, what is a completion point? How do we know when a turn is going to come to an end? Okay, because if, um, if we manage this turn-taking system so smoothly, so that there are very few gaps and very little overlap, how do we know where, when to take our turns? That's the puzzle. Because obviously, we don't always speak in sentences. Obviously, to, to linguists, the sentence is the fundamental um, unit of uh, language. But in interaction, often we don't talk in sentences. So it's not the case that you wait for the end of the sentence, just as you don't wait for the pause at the end of the sentence because usually there, there isn't a call. So how do we know when, when to take our turn? How do we manage this system so smoothly? 
So we need to know what, what terms consist of. If they're not always sentences, what are they? How do we know when we're getting to the end of a unit? So they, <coughs> um, Sachs, uh, Shagel and Jefferson talked about um, term construction units, um, or TCUs. Turn construction unit. So the, this is what turns are made up of turn construction units, and uh, we have this in your heading here turn construction unit. So we don't always talk in sentences, as I say. We, um, a single word, a phrase, a clause, even a gesture or a laugh. Or uh, mm -hmm. they can all be meaningful contributions. They can all be meaningful actions. So I've said turn construction units enable hearers to predict the kind of action they will involve and what it will take for that action to be complete. So as I say, what's important here is action. Not meaning necessarily, that's part of it, but the most important thing is action. So, <coughs> what we seem to, to do is look for the action of a term and <coughs> we predict, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we predict when that action will be complete. And that's the end of the term construction unit, the TCU. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So it says here the first possible completion point is called a transition relevance place, or uh, the short TR. TRP, or transition relevance place. This is where turn taking can occur. So at the end of every turn construction unit, you have a transition relevance place. At the end of every TCU, you have a TRP. And that is where turn taking can occur. Okay, so let's uh, start with some simple examples. So, a very simple exchange. We have a um, single word TCU, another single word TCU, and so at the end of each TCU there's a transition over into place. Okay? So, is that okay? You get that? Fairly straightforward so far, isn't it? Yeah? Okay. Um, however, it can get slightly more complicated. Okay, so A says, hello, how are you? How many TCUs? How many turn construction units? One. one. Any advance on one? <laughs> two. Two. Yes. Okay. So two actions here. So you have a greeting. So that's your greeting, and then you have a question. How are you? And then you have, so here, we have a TRP. Okay, so a single turn of talk can be made up of more than one TCU. That's where it gets a bit confusing. Okay. And what you, off, what you might get is B, orienting to this as a TCU, 
and you might if you get some overlap there. Um, because there's the TRP there, B has every right to come in there, it's an acceptable place to come in. So they could have said hello, but A continues. So what you could have is, this is the same speaker continue, and this is the, um, the next speaker self-selecting at the same point. And those are the sorts of points you often get overlap. So overlap, we don't call it interruption in, in CA because it's actually people orienting to the turn-taking system. They are actually trying to follow the turn-taking system. They, they are usually trying to begin at a TRP. The only, the only time we might call it interruption is something like, let me give you an example. Um, in fact, we'll, we'll, we'll see some examples in a minute. Um, but, uh, so if A says, um, um, and then you have, um, so if A was saying something like, by the way, I was thinking, now that's clearly not a complete action, is it? We don't know, we don't have enough information yet to know what A is trying to do with his turn or her turn. So B, <coughs> excuse me, B is coming in not at a turn construction unit, uh, sorry, not at a transition relevance place here. So this is what we might call interruption. Okay, but it's a difficult term because it is very value laden, isn't it? We tend to think of interruption as bad. Um, <clears throat> so what we might, and Jefferson tried to do, is develop a technical understanding of what interruption is. And this is what Jefferson said, it's coming in when you clearly haven't got near um, a term construction, uh, uh, um, a transit and relevance place, mid TCU. Okay. So, as I say, the important thing to remember is that a single turn talk can be made up of several turn construction units, and therefore there can be several transition relevance places during the turn that <coughs> the other speaker may not self-select, the other speaker may stay quiet and let speaker A have a long turn. Okay, what I'd like to do then is give you a chance to have a look at uh, some examples. Um, well, a, a particular example to start off with. Um, so what we can do here, um, we have a, an extract from a telephone conversation. Um, and I think um, what we may do, uh, we can do look at two things. One is to start by simply looking at the turns and seeing um, how many turn construction units are in the turns. Is it a single turn construction unit? Is it a more than one turn construction unit within the turn? The other thing you might do if you have time is look at, um, I mentioned overlap and interruption because when you're looking at turn taking, obviously, um, it is useful to think about overlap and interruption because although we don't have a lot of overlap in talk, um, often around those TRPs you do get a little bit of overlap as we'll see on the transcript. So there are various places where you might get it. So if you get, as I say, uh, one would be um, one would be kind of here is a very common place, so A takes another turn, has another turn construction unit, and B comes in at that TRP. So it's not interruption because A, it, B is orienting to the TRP, um, but just coming in. So that's a very common place for overlap. Another common place for overlap is um, <coughs> is <coughs> a 
around about the end of a turn construction unit, so we have one turn construction unit here, and often because speaker B is waiting for that opportunity to come in, they may just come in just slightly early and just clip the, uh, the end of the turn construction unit. Another thing you will see in this data is that, um, <coughs> let me see, um, Okay, so um, say A is telling a story or have taken quite a long turn and they say, so that was it. We were we were going out tonight or something, or we were we were we were driving in the car. Um, what's very common is to get these little minimal responses. So B is just saying, I'm listening, this is a TRP here. So they often do come around TRPs, even though they're just these little minimal turns. People do usually try and orient to the TRPs with them, but, um, but they're just taking a minimal turn saying, you carry on, I'm listening, I don't want to take a turn here. Okay, so we'll see some of those in this, this example. Okay, so let me um, play it through. I hope you'll be able to follow it okay. Um, as I say, oh, 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 one other thing, you might see some possible interruption in this example as well, where you get someone coming in mid-TCU. Um, let's see what you think. <coughs> so I will play it um, a few times. You've got your data here, so follow it, follow it on the uh, transcript. Um, but I will play it a few times. The sound quality is not brilliant, I'm afraid. The uh, speakers are a little bit present. Um, but hopefully you will be able to understand it. So. is names are changed, names are different in the transcript than they are on the recording, because when we transcribe in conversation analysis, we usually change names for anonymity. Okay, so um, you'll just notice they're different names. Okay, I'll play, I'll play that through again. Transcript, there looks like a lot of overlap. You know, there's a lot of these brackets going down from one line to the next line, which suggests there's a lot of overlap. But I think when you hear it, you realise that actually it comes across as very smooth. If there is overlap, it's, it's tiny. Um, and a lot of the overlap is not necessarily um, talking, it can be these and um, that sort of thing. It's not words, it's other things. So it, 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 it is actually smoother than it looks like on the transcript. So what we can do is go through, as I say, and, and think about the things that we've talked about so far, which is how turns um, are made, you know, what they're made up of. Um, do they have, does a turn at talk have more than one turn construction unit? Is a single turn construction unit, and does it have two or three turn construction units? Where is the TRP? Where is the transit and relevance place? Does someone come in at that transit and relevance place or does the same speaker continue? And then if you have a chance, um, you might look at the overlap. Does the overlap occur near these transit and relevance places? Or does it come in mid-TCU? And if it does come in mid-TCU, then might we want to call that interruption? Okay, is that, is that okay? So what I'm gonna do is play it through one more time uh, well, I can play through more if you'd like that, that's fine. Uh, but I'll certainly play it through one more time um, and then you can tell me if you want it played again. Um, and then I will give you um, maybe 15 minutes to, to go through and have a look at those uh, issues. Is that okay? Does that sound okay? Okay, 
Okay, so I'll play it through one more time and then decide if you need to hear it more than that as well.
So sometimes we see these little things maybe tagged onto the end of a TCU that doesn't stand on its own. It's not, you can't, you know, doesn't make sense on, on its own, or isn't it? Those sorts of things, they don't make sense on their own, but you can tag them onto the end of, of a TCU. So you extending the TCU. So Shevron talks about increments. So they're one of the things that make it a little bit more complicated looking for these boundaries. Uh, anyway, okay, so we get, to, um, I think, they seem to think it's all right, you know. So there is a TRP around about there. Um, and again, Joyce comes in with, mm. But then Leslie continues with the next TCU. That is being dealt with. Um, and she's on tablets, not radium treatment. So again, two, two, C, two C, TCUs there. Um, now then Joyce starts another t turn, doesn't she? Oh, I do hope. Now, that's not a complete TCU, is it? Oh, I do hope. She's not got to the end of that. She's not even really got to near the end of that. You know, it needs a bit more. Oh, I do hope she's all right, for example. But Leslie starts talking, um, or radium treatment. So do we think that might be a good candidate for an interruption? For Leslie coming in mid-TCU? Yeah, yeah, I think this is a good possible candidate for an interruption. So Joyce is saying, oh, I do hope she hasn't got to the end of it. Leslie needs to do this repair. She's got it wrong, she thinks. Um, not radio treatment um, or radium treatment. So she's, she's made a mistake, she's doing a repair. Um, and so she comes in in um, possibly, over, well, we think overlapped Joyce to add that, to do that repair. And I've noticed a lot of these actually, they, they happen a lot around places where people are moving on. Um, so it looks like, you know, Joyce is moving on. Leslie's given her information, you know, she's, she's got cancer, but they, they think they've dealt with it. Um, she's on tablets, she's not on radium treatment. She's got to the end of that. And it looks like Joyce is moving on a little bit, oh, I do hope she's all right, to the sort of next phase of the, Leslie's given the information, then, um, Joyce is assessing it. Um, so if Leslie doesn't come in quickly, she's going to lose her chance. You can't do the repair. You can't do repair, you know, long after <laughs> when you can, but it's very awkward to say, actually, when I said that two seconds ago, it, I actually meant that. It's very difficult. So you've got to get in and do repair quickly. Um, so it looks like she's interrupting to, to do that repair before the topic moves on. Okay, um, and then um, I was talking to um, Helen Sotherby next door but one. Um, do you know Helen Sotherby? So again, at least uh, possibly two TCUs there. This is one I want to listen through carefully because you get, I was talking to um, Helen Sotherby and then a micro pause, uh, next door but one. These are the, the sorts of places where you need to listen to see how people are, whether they're constructing it as kind of two TCUs or a single TCU. So one of the things we find when we apply this to talk is that it's not always straightforward because people are trying to negotiate it moment by moment. And they can do things like realize that a TRP is coming up in their turn and they work to avoid it, like they add an increment or something like that. So you get a bit of negotiation going on. And so it's very important to look at each case very carefully and to, um, to often hear it as well, because say to intonation can be important. And pauses are very important, I think, for this as well. Now, um, one of the reasons I gave you this, this bit is because um, after this, when, when Joyce does a, what's potentially a very long TCU, um, oh shit, poor dear, back in um, Easter, yes, Easter, she developed a lump in her neck. <coughs> and she had, well, first she had that lump removed and the second one came up and then that one removed. Never since then she'd been having chemotherapy and you know, all sorts of nasty. And Joyce does these little mmms that carry, that link things together. Mm. Um, now I think there are a couple of boundaries in that. Um, 
partly because she starts on one track and then she repairs. Yes, Easter, she, she developed a, neck, a, a lump in her neck and she had that. And then she stops there and then she goes, well, she first had that lump removed and then, then a second one came up. So, again, potentially a TRP, I think, uh, after that. Um, first she had that lump removed. Then the second one came up and had that removed. And we get Joyce, we get Leslie orienting to came up as the end of a unit, don't we? She comes in with, oh dear. But, Leslie, uh, but Joyce carries on and that one removes. Ever since then she's been having chemotherapy and you know, all sorts of nasty. That chunk, um, if I was going through it and trying to identify the TCUs and the TRPs, I would be listening through that very carefully. And one of the things that you can do in CA is you may, um, you may think that, um, okay, it's, it's a potential TRP. I think it's a TRP there. Um, here's the evidence. Um, and you can try and argue, yes, I think it's a TRP, but, but possibly the, you know, there's a possibility that the, the hearer, say, doesn't treat it as a TRP or the speaker doesn't treat it as a TRP. And you just look for the evidence and you, you try and um, look at these things very carefully, line by line, turn by turn, and um, see how the speakers are negotiating and working out these things in their talk. Okay. So what we're saying is we're saying they're orienting to the social norms of turn taking and this is why we tend to get quite short turns because you cannot help but have all these TRPs even if you want to take a long turn and you um, have lots of things to say, you still find that you have these TRPs in your talk and people can come in. Obviously, there are other sort of social norms that affect that. So, for example, none of you are taking turns at my TRPs because the social norm is that, um, unless it's really important, probably, <laughs> you don't take those TRPs. Um, so that's where the turn-taking changes in different situations and the norms change in different situations. However, I've still got those TRPs all the time. I can't avoid that. Um, and, it is, and it is possible that you might put your hand up and, and try and come in with a TRP. So that's why we tend, and particularly in informal interaction, tend to have very short terms because you cannot avoid the TRPs. Okay, is that maybe a good time to, to, to break off for lunch? I don't end up talking about the serious thing. And so uh, this organisation wanted to find out how do you make sure that patients talk about the serious thing. And they found out that if doctors said, do you have a question at the end of the talk about the less serious thing, then patients would say no, no, it's fine. If the doctor says, do you have another question, people go on and they talk about it. So that very, very small um, difference to the design of the question, do you have another question or do you have a question, makes a big difference to whether people will then talk about the thing that they've actually come for. So from, from early days it's had these practical implications and, and Sachs say, was given a similar kind of question, was how do, you, how do you work out when people are going to refuse to give their name? Okay. So there's a very nice study um, on news interviews. So, news, you know, um, like when news interviewers um, talk to politicians, say interviewers must not give feedback because if the politician's talking and if they're going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it looks like the news interviewer is agreeing. So news interviewers don't give feedback. And that's part of being, part of being, doing being a news interviewer, as Sachs would say. Part of doing being a news interviewer is you don't give feedback. Uh, or minimal responses, as we would say in conversation analysis. So rather than looking at type of person, we would look at role and context, things like that. Again, in a doctor-patient interaction, the doctor may not uh, give a lot of um, minimal responses. 
um, because they're waiting, they don't want to kind of suggest that the term's finished or, or suggest kind of agreement or something like that. They might withhold those sort of minimal responses until the patient's clearly got to the end of their term. It's all right. It's all right. For example, we are having the decision, so then I can draw this thing from the beginning. Just before I come, like, before I ask you anything, like, I just have several questions to ask you, mm -hmm. and I just and just make our answers, which you need to that. Those, I think, like, you can make some good calls. Mm -hmm. I tend to do that as well. Yeah, like, what questions yeah. all the way through? Yeah, yeah. So I, I almost, if I don't do my teacher, like, if I want to avoid a topological question, mm -hmm. then I try to, like, uh, sidetrack the question. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to, for example, if he likes something, like, like, about the food, and then if he's talking about my marks, mm -hmm. I could, like, if festivals are coming, then can I just control her, like, right? by saying that control. I can about the food itself, like, <laughs> about my performance? Mm, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, so, so how much can you con con yes. kind of control the flow? It's difficult because it is a negotiation. So one of the things, and I think we were talking about this a little bit, is that um, one thing that people often want to do when they look at interaction early on is, is look at who's dominating. I, I know in, in England, in, in Britain,
trying to describe some obvious kind of pictures of adjacency pairs. So um, adjacency pairs are sequences of utterances that are adjacent, or we'll say usually adjacent in a minute, produced by different speakers. They're ordered, so there's a first pair part and a second pair part. So obviously, if you have a question-answer pair, the question has to come first, the answer has to come second. And they're typed so that a particular first part requires a particular second or one from a, a small range of seconds. So offers require acceptances or rejections, greetings require other greetings. So there's a rule governing um, the use of adjacency, namely having produced a first pair part of some pair, current speaker must stop speaking, the next speaker must produce that that point a second part to the same pair. So that's kind of the norm, the social norm that we orient to. So I've got some examples there. Um, so the child say, uh, Dad, can you uh, put the light on in my room? And then uh, so question and then the answer, yeah, sure. Um, but, this, but then um, uh, an awkward example, student one saying, hello, my name is Jeff, and student two saying, let's get a pizza. It doesn't quite fit as if you'd expect. <laughs> Hi, my name is <laughs> Mary, whatever. So um, you need a particular second pair part that it has to match the first pair part. Um, now, when do we know that something is a second pair part? Because as, as we've said, when is it, sorry, when, when do we know it's a suggested pair? As we've said, um, all turns of talk are tied tied together, unless, unless you specifically work to, to disconnect the tying mechanisms, unless you say something like, oh, sorry, can I just butt in there and can I say, so you're saying don't, don't interpret this in terms of what's just gone before. But normally turn, turns are tied together. So how do we know when it's an adjacency pair and when it's just two terms that are happen to be tied together but they're not an adjacency pair? And, um, one of the things we can look at, one of the things that you'll read about in the literature in conversation analysis is that if you, if the second pair part is missing, it's noticeably absent. It's a noticeable absence if you don't get the second pair part because you're breaking that norm that we just talked about. So if I say hello and you've clearly heard me, but you don't say hello back, then I might think, oh, why didn't they say hello? Have I upset them? Are they not talking to me? You know, what's gone wrong? So uh, it's a noticeable absence. Um, one of the ones that I, um, I tend to work through at this point when I've got more time with my students is, um, uh, uh, this, is a call, this is from the same call, actually, I was talking about earlier with the boys and the girlfriend, and uh, you get... Um, you get this, you get, uh, they're moving to closing, uh, so A, so the girlfriend says, take care. And uh, the boyfriend says, uh, love you. And the girlfriend says, ooh, ah. And, and then we get laughter uh, by the girlfriend, actually. Um, and then uh, and the boyfriend saying, what? 
And then the, uh, finally, the girlfriend saying, um, uh, don't forget to ring Scott. Don't forget to ring, you're going to ring that, I'm sorry, uh, Scott. Space there. Don't forget to ring Scott. So, um, is there a noticeable absence here, do you think? What, what is missing, do you think, from this conversation closing? Thank you. Thank you, yeah, it could be, or um, basically I think, mm -hmm. do you think that's love you in, cl in closing could be uh, an adjacency pair? I'm not saying that love you, I don't think love you is always an adjacency pair, is it? There, there might be occasions when you would say it and you wouldn't expect that. But I think in closing, in this sort of, in this context, it's probably an adjacency pair. Um, and certainly you get them orienting to, to this as something, <laughs> something going strangely wrong here. So, yeah, so B says, love you. She says, ooh, ah. She laughs, and then he says, what? And then she says, don't forget to ring Scott tonight. So she's kind of suggesting that her sudden ooh, ah, was remembering that they'd agreed to ring Scott. Um, and maybe this gets out of doing the, the expected um, second pair part of love you too, or love you back, or love you, you know, just love you, whatever. So, so I would say that there's a noticeable absence here, that, uh, that um, she doesn't say um, love you back. Evidence for the, f or one little piece of evidence for the fact that that is a noticeable absence is that they, then they go back into the closing, so A said, um, so A says, don't forget to ring Scott. B says something like, um, yeah, we'll do. And then they go back into the closing, but A does not, B, sorry, does not do love you again. If he'd really thought that she didn't do love you back because um, you know, she'd suddenly remembered that they had to plan to ring Scott, he probably would have done love you again, but he doesn't do it. So I think he picks up on the fact that uh, you know, there's a noticeable absence. She hasn't responded with love you. Um, Anyway, so that's yeah, an example perhaps of, of uh, how we might distinguish um, adjacency pairs from, from other terms that just happen to be closely tied together. <coughs> so there's a bit of uh, dispute in the literature about um, involving laughter. Is a joke plus laughter, is that a, an adjacency pair? Because if you get a joke and then no laughter, I guess that, that's, that can be a noticeable absence, can't it? So there's probably good evidence for joke plus laughter being a, an adjacency pair. So, um, so adjacency pairs, as I say, are very important and relevant for two reasons, I think. One is that they show that terms are very closely tied together, so they really illustrate those tying mechanisms very well. Um, going right back to you know Sachs's first, first kind of the birth of CA when Sachs saw the terms were very tied together in those calls to suicide prevention centre. The other thing is that they're very very common. Lots of interaction it consists of adjacency pairs. Some interaction is pretty much all adjacency pairs. So if you think of things like news interviews, job interviews, doctor-patient interaction, classroom talk to some extent, um, what else? Uh, um, courtrooms, um, you know, cross-examination or examination in courtrooms. Um, they're all question answer, question answer, question answer. So adjacency pairs are very, very common in interaction. So that's another reason why they're important and why they've received a lot of attention in the literature. Um, okay, so that's adjacency pairs. Now, we've seen that one of the rules is that they are tied together and they, you get the first pair part and the second pair part. But there are occasions where you don't get the first pair part and then straight away the second pair part. And this is called uh, insertion sequences. So although they're mostly adjacent, there are occasions when they're not adjacent, they're, 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 uh, there's something in between. And so um, I've given you a little bit of information on insertion sequences there. Um, my arrows didn't come out very well, but I hope you get the, the idea. Um, 
So you might get occasions where you get something like um, uh, you're going tonight. The what time does it start? So you've got, are you going tonight? What time does it start? Eight. Um, okay. So what you have here is you have um, a first pair part. Um, but where's the second pair part for this one? The last one. The last one, exactly. That's its second pair part. So what you have is um, first pair part, second pair part, and then uh, this in between. And this, of course, is another adjacency pair. Question answer. So this is what we call an insertion sequence, where you get something inserted between the first pair part and the second pair part. Now again, they could be quite important because um, some calls are, or some conversations rather, are can be huge long insertion sequences. So for example, calls to 911 or 999, you know the emergency services. Um, they can be entirely an insertion sequence. So you get someone saying, um, you know, can I have an ambulance? And then you'll have a big long insertion sequence to you know what's the problem, what, what's your address, are they still conscious, you know, blah, 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 blah. Then you'll get the second pair part of that initial first pair part. Um, yes, the ambulance is on the way. So some sort of calls like that, um, it, some interactions can be pretty much entirely in the insertion sequence. And there's a very nice uh, analysis by Shekhov um, on a, a call, a telephone call, an American telephone call, where um, a student rings up and she's, she asks her friend, um, can I borrow your gun? <laughs> and <laughs> so there's a very long insertion sequence, there's only in America, uh, where he's saying, what do you want it for, which one? Uh, what do you want it for? And then finally it emerges that she wants to borrow it from play, hopefully. Um, but the whole thing is this big long insertion sequence. And, and finally he says yes, we can. But, uh, so a, after a lot, lot of talk. So yes, we get these long insertion sequences sometimes. Um, uh, another thing I just wanted to introduce about um, uh, related to adjacency pairs, but going beyond adjacency pairs, really, because it started off as something that was noticed in respect of adjacency pairs, but it has become something much more important than that, looking at lots of different sequences. It's a bit of a disputed term, but, uh, but it's also a very useful term. And this is the idea of preference organisation. And for those of you interested in politeness, um, this is probably where the politeness theory and CA connect most closely. There's a lot of overlap, I think, a lot of connection between um, particularly preference and politeness theory. Um, because, um, okay, so it was noticed that um, uh, there's a difference So if I say something like, um, let's say, would you like uh, to come uh, to dinner? Okay, so the acceptance, the second pair part of acceptance would be something like, might be something like this, um, uh, yes, I'd love to. Okay, so that would be the acceptance. So, however, the, the opposite, the rejection, uh, would be something like, if it was a mirror image, uh, something like that, no, I'd hate it. <laughs> that's the mirror image, you know, that's the same thing, but, the, but in the negative. 
Um, and of course, that's not what we generally get then with us, because that be very, seems very impolite. Um, so what we'll get is something rather different. So you might get a bit of um, class of pause, half a second pause maybe, and then something like, um, oh, uh, well, I'd love to, but uh, I'm, oh, I'd love to, but I'm busy tonight. Okay, I would more likely get a proper account, oh, I'd love to, but I, I can't get a babysitter for tonight, or oh, I've got to finish my assignment for tonight, or something like that. Okay, so it's done rather differently. And um, on the handout it talks about, um, you know, this is the, the marked, marked and unmarked versions, which is another similar concept, another similar observation about the same sort of thing. So you've got it, it's delayed, the whole turn is delayed. It's, it's kind of, it's delayed within the turn, the actual rejection is delayed within the turn. You've got these turn initials, as we say, oh well. Then something that looks positive at the beginning, a positive assessment, I'd love to. Um, and then an account, but I'm busy tonight. Um, so all those sorts of things are very typical of dispreferred second pair parts. So <clears throat> what B is doing there is orienting to the fact that a cultural norm is that um, in our society turning down, rejecting an invitation is, you know, it's tricky, it's problematic. So what we see here is lots of orientation to that cultural norm, that certain actions are preferred and certain actions are disfavored. So when we're talking about preference, uh, about preferred and dispreferred actions, it's a bit of a confusing term because obviously we tend to think of preference as being about our personal pre preference. You know, I prefer blue to green or something like that, or I prefer coffee to tea. But it's not that sort of personal psychological preference. When we talk about preference in CA, it's, the, it's a cultural preference, if you like. There is a cultural norm, a cultural preference, that um, rejections are, are dispreferred or tricky. So for example, if, um, as always happens, uh, every year I get invited to my childminder's Christmas party, and um, I don't particularly like going to this childminder's <laughs> Christmas party for various reasons, partly because I don't know anyone that ever very much. So uh, my personal preference is not to go. But of course, if I can't go, um, I wouldn't say, actually, no, I don't want to come. I would say, you know, oh, what a shame. That's a real shame. It's happening the same night that um, we're going into the theater or something like that. So I would do it as a dispreferred, even though my personal preference might not be, might be to, to, to not go. OK, so it's not about personal preference, it's about um, cultural norms again. So this is why it's quite close to politeness, I think. And then, again, they're getting at similar things. Um, so, uh, what have we got on that? So, um, you've got quite a lot of information on that. I just wanted to, yeah, uh, before we move on, to just say, um, So, how do we spot dispreferred turns? As I say, it is a bit disputed because um, initially the idea of preference came out of looking at adjacency pairs and it, it was very much um, meant to look at these second pair parts where it, it was done as the dispreferred to the first pair part. It was a marked kind of second pair part. Preference has been used a bit more generally than that because it's a very useful um, term. So for example, in disagreements, we might see, if you're disagreeing with me or something, you might see various markers of dis preference. Um, but anyway, so how, how do we know when a turn is dispreferred? Um, as I say, there are very uh, common kinds of uh, patterns. So for example, as I say, they, they tend to be delayed 
Now that can be, the turn itself can be delayed, as I say, often if one pauses and things. Um, uh, then um, you often get these turn initials uh, like, um, oh, uh, well. <coughs> If you ask a question, if you ask someone a question and they say, "Well," you know that things are not going well. <laughs> and so, "Well" is very commonly associated with dispreferred terms. Um, self-repair. You get a lot of self-repair. <coughs> so this is when um, people will start to say, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well. Yeah, that sort of thing, when you can't get your turn out, you're repairing it all the time, you start to say it the wrong way, and then you change it to something else, that's self repair. Accounts, very common. So you don't tend to do this preferred uh, without an account of why you're doing it. So if you turn down an invitation or a request, you will usually say, why, why that is, you'll give a reason for it. Whereas obviously for accepting it, you, there's no need to give an account. Um, what else do we say? Um, sort of um, like careful, careful packaging, I might put it. You know, we're very, we might put things very carefully. So, for example, I've got an, uh, an example I use a lot where someone um, has bought a print and they're showing their friend and they say, do you like the print? And the friend says, yes, I do like it, but I really I prefer the kind of art that, well, the kind of art that's not the sort of magazine type. I prefer, I prefer it to be more realistic. So he gives quite the account, there's a lot of self-repair, it's very balanced, it's not... I don't like that type of bar. And he does, he does a very interesting self repair because he starts to say, well, I don't really, and then he changes it to, I'm not a fan of this kind of art. So it's very carefully built, um, and you can partly see that through the self repair. <coughs> um, now, uh, one of the, um, there's been some very nice uh, work, um, it's mentioned in the handout by um, Anita Pomerantz, and it was her work early on that really developed this idea of <coughs> a preference. Um, and she was looking at assessments. So you've got the reference, uh, reference in here. Um, and she noticed that um, assessments are, are, are adjacency pairs. So if, you, if I say something like, um, uh, it's a nice uh, lunch. Okay, what, what would be the preferred second pair part? Sorry? Indeed it was. Indeed it was, yes, exactly. So an agreement, agreement, something like indeed it was, yes. Yes, so agreement is the preferred second pair part. Um, how else might you agree? How else might you do another preferred, another preferred response? Sorry? Yes, thank you. Yes, something like that. Yes, so then you're treating it as a kind of um, uh, well, if you yeah, if you say it's a nice nice lunch, that might be a kind of yeah compliment. That, that's right. That's right. Um, another thing that you might do to to agree um, in, is you might do an upgrade. So it was a nice lunch. It was lovely. So that's very common. It's a nice day today. Oh, it's gorgeous. So very common you'll get is um, the um, adjective might be upgraded. You might go stronger in the second one. So this is an agreement. This is a preferred self, uh, a preferred response. But they're not always. It's not black and white. They're not always um, you know clearly preferred or clearly dispreferred. So what you might get um, is. Um, Something like that. Yes, it was nice. 
Now, what would you take if you said it's a, it's a nice lunch, and I said yes, it was nice? What might you take from that? <laughs> it's not nice, yeah. Exactly, yes. And I might, I might go on, I uh, wouldn't definitely because it was lovely. But I might want to say uh, great, um, but it's but there wasn't much choice or something like that. Okay. So this kind of thing often prefigures a disagreement, a dispreferred response. Okay. So generally. Um, the preferred response to an assessment is an agreement, or, and, and as I say, you might do that agreement through an upgraded, um, upgrading the, uh, the assessment. However, it's not as straightforward as the fact that agreement is always preferred. Because what Anita Pomerantz noticed was that there are occasions when that's not the case. So if I say um, something like, uh, if I say I look terrible in this top, <laughs> I don't want agreement. <laughs> I don't want, yes you do, I want disagreement. So I want, um, Hopefully, someone might say, no, you don't. Okay, so in that situation, disagreement is preferred. Okay, and that would be the same for, um, if I said, you know, something like, uh, oh, that, that um, supposing I'd thrown a party and I said, oh dear, it, it was a bit, uh, it, 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 it was a bit quiet or it was a bit boring, wasn't it? And again, disagreement would be the preferred response. No, it wasn't, it was great. Okay, so it's not, unfortunately, a simple case of agreement is always the preferred response and disagreement is always dispreferred. Okay, so that's um, a quick sort of introduction to adjacency pairs and related issues of insertion sequence and uh, preference. One other thing I just want to talk about because it's, it might be useful for our next um, Data analysis is Shegloff has done some lovely work on a certain kind of adjacency pair, and it's what he calls um, pre's or pre sequences. And these are things like can I ask you a question? Or, um, or something really interesting happened today as a pre-sequence to tell a story. Um, interestingly, he noticed uh, with the, the questions like that, pre -se um, the, he called them pre-pre's. <laughs> um, because uh, if you say, can I ask you a question? You don't normally then ask the question. You normally say, uh, because I was wondering about um, X, Y, and Z, and then I thought, is it the case that? And so you actually get the question some, some way further down, um, and so they are split again by a So, um, So in storytelling, for example, you'll get something like, um, you know, um, Something, uh, something really strange happened. Today. Um, and then uh, the uh, what, which is the go ahead, and then then you probably get the build up to the story. Well, I was um, I was walking home from school, walking home from work, and I thought I can get the brief. So you get these pre-sequences. Um, I've talked about adjacency pairs and related issues of pre-sequences and insertion sequences. So what I would like to do now is again give you more chance to do some analysis. Um, I would like to illustrate how conversation analysis works. 
Okay, we've looked at some of the sort of fundamental findings of CA, and hopefully that's given you some insight into how to do conversation analysis. But what I'd like to do um, now for the rest of the time is two things. One is to illustrate how conversation analysis works by working on data and seeing what, what we can make of it. And two, obviously that will also teach you more about certain things. We're going to focus particularly on two things, which is reported speech today and then laughter tomorrow. Uh, but as is typical with CA, we don't just focus on just those things. It's relevant to look at the whole sequence. You need to look at the whole sequence. And then slowly you can build up an idea of where the laughter it occurs, what kind of environment it occurs in, how is it built, does it come at specific points in that talk, or you know, does it occur anywhere. So you look at the whole sequence, you look at all the surrounding actions. So we're going to do that as well. So um, I picked two things from my research, so the port of speech that I've researched for many years, and then laughter, which again I've researched for many years. I'm still publishing on both of those things. And I think, um, I think they're both nice to illustrate, I think, how CA works and how interaction works. Reported speech is a nice um, thing to look at, I think, because it's so common, it crops up all over the place, it's very important. <coughs> So, for example, a bit of a sideline of mine, um, something I'm hoping to get into but I haven't really developed yet, is looking at um, stand-up comedy. Um, and reported speech is absolutely crucial for stand-up comedy. You know, comedians um, are telling stories, and the stories involve all these um, long sections of reported speech where they're enacting characters and, um, and, and quoting uh, people. So, so reported speech, as I say, is very common, it's very nice. If you have um, an interest in other areas, obviously it's relevant for, for linguists and for um, stylistics and uh, all of, uh, many, many areas of uh, literature, even looking at reported speech. Um, so we'll do that. And as I say, what I hope to show is the kinds of things that CA can, can tell us, that using CA, what, what, you know, what benefit does it have? And so I'm hoping to illustrate that through report speech and then move on tomorrow to laughter. Okay, so what I would like to do, as I say also, is giving you more time to talk and to work on data as well, because it's mostly been me, but I'd like to give you more chance now. Um, so what I'd like to do to start off with is look at a storytelling. It's a very famous storytelling in that it's been used in a lot of research. There's a lot of articles out there that use this particular story. Um, I've published articles on it, John Harris has published articles, Paul Drew, many, many people have used this, this data, this extract. Um, and the reason it's very rich, very, very rich, I think there's lots we can do about it. All those articles are on different things. So it's been looked at from many different angles and people have found evidence for very different things in this one storytelling. John Heritage at UCLA sets it as his end of term um, exam uh, because he says it's so rich that the students can find you know, endless things to talk about. Everything that he covers in the course he, you can find in this story. Um, according to John Heritage, so, so it's his, his, his exam piece. Um, so I want to start off with that. So you will see reported speech, but as I say, I don't want to just focus on that. I want to focus on other things as well. So to start off with, I'm just going to let you hear it and work on it and just work your way through and just see what you notice, okay? So you can have a look at reported speech. Um, obviously, that's one of the things to look at, but just see how, how they get to that point. What kind of kind of talk is it? What are they doing? You know, what's the, what's the environment, as it were? Um, where does the report speech come? But what, what happens in the lead up to it as well? Uh, what happens afterwards? How is it responded to? Okay. So go through and look at the whole thing and just see what you notice to start off with. And then we'll, then we'll focus in a bit more on the report speech as we go through. Okay, does that sound all right? Okay, so this is Extract number one on page 11. So, firstly, I will play it through sometimes. It's a phone call between Leslie again and Joyce, um, just 
just chatting. Um, they've talked about some arrangements and then they start talking about, um, well, Leslie starts telling the story. Okay, so let me put it several times. if you like, thinking about the uh, transcript, following down each turn, following through. Um, but also how turns are designed, so that for me is the kind of horizontal tra trajectory, is looking at the um, how each turns are, are designed within that sequence. 
So for me, um, I think it's useful to look at, to think about the sequence and then think about the design of the turns, the design of the actions within those sequences. Sometimes it can be very useful to think about how else you could do something. So for example, when I was um, working on um, idiomatic expressions and you know, figurative expressions, it was often very useful to think about the kind of literal alternative if there was one. Um, and to think, well, why didn't they use the literal alternative? Why use a figurative expression instead? And that proved to be very useful in thinking, well, what do figurative expressions do that literal expressions don't do? Same thing with reported speech often is to think about, you know, what, how, how could you have done it without using reported speech? And what would that have done which reported speech, uh, or what would, that would, what would that not have done that reported speech don't do? Uh, thinking about um, if it was indirect reported speech, um, how would you do that? Uh, what does indirect reported speech that direct reported speech doesn't do? What does direct reported speech that indirect doesn't do? So it's, that's another useful analytic kind of exercise, I think, to think about what else could have been done there, and then that leads you to think why why ch choose this particular way of doing it? What's it doing? Why is it useful this way? Okay. So, um, so as I say, um, shout out if you need to, to hear that again. Let me give you sort of, um, we'll see how long we need, but say, say if we aim for about 20, 25 minutes looking at this, see how, see how we get on at least. Um, and as I say, so one of the things maybe is to look at the report of speech, but I think it's worthwhile just tracking through the whole thing and seeing how they get to the report of speech and what happens beforehand and how it fits in the whole sequence. Okay, and also what happens afterwards as well, which is very interesting. Okay, does that sound alright? Okay, great. Just get, get data and go through it and then see what's interesting, what's important. However, of course, you know, it's not always um, possible to do that. Sometimes you need to have a clear idea of what you're going to look at, especially if you have to apply for grants or, or you know, apply to do a PhD, you have to say, I'm going to look at X, Y, and Z. Um, so we've had a possible focus, which is looking at the um, reported speech. Uh, and we're going to hone in on that and look at the report of speech in more detail in a minute. But um, we're going to start off uh, talking about the storytelling a little bit more generally because I think people were going through and noticing different things and not necessarily just focusing on the report of speech. So we'll talk about the storytelling first and then we'll spend a bit more time focusing specifically on the report of speech. Okay, so... Um, so I was talking to a lot of people about the beginning bit, this, uh, you know, I'm broiling about something, and then she laughs. And we were talking about that as a, as a story preface, um, a pre-sequence that's introducing storytelling. And, you know, one of the things I said is you can think about how else it could have been done. It's an interesting analytic exercise to think how else could she have done that storytelling, that, sorry, that uh, story preface. And uh, one of the things I was saying is one of th what she doesn't do is say, um, you know, oh, a horrible thing happened to me. Mr. Mr. R said something terrible to me today. She doesn't do something very specific like that. What it does, you know, I'm broiling about something and the laughter, it gives a sort of a vague general idea of what the story is going to be about. And it gives Joyce information about what what it will take for the story to, to be complete. You know, when she gets to, when Leslie gets to what she's broiling about, then that's, the story's complete. But um, it doesn't give a very specific idea of what is, what's happened, or her attitude towards it, her stance, <coughs> okay? And I think that's 
that's very important. Um, that's what story prefaces need to do. They need to give a kind of general, vague idea. You get the, you, you get your recipient curious, accepts up a puzzle. You invite them in. You invite them to to wonder what she's broiling about. What what she's talking about. What's, what you know, what what does this mean? Um. So then she um. The laughter is interesting as well. I think. Uh, it, you know, it, again, it indicates something about her stance, but vaguely, very vaguely. So she's, she said, "I'm brilliant about something," implying you know she's cross about something, she's upset about something, or she, yeah, she's a little bit, a little bit angry about something. I think it means. But then she laughs to say, "Well, it's not a big deal. This is not. It's not really tragic, terrible storytelling." Okay. So, but again, it's quite vague. So it leaves Joyce the chance to say, you know, what. So that's the go ahead, tell the story. So then she goes to sort of background information, doesn't she? Background detailing. Will that sail at the vicarage? Um, and Joyce says, oh yes. So she's obviously giving a fairly minimal response there, saying, you know, I know what you're talking about. Um, your friend and mine was there, which is an interesting way to put it. One of the things that does is, is it indicates, um, obviously, that. Um, and some of you noticed that you know Joyce and Leslie are clearly friends. One, it's a nice indication of their friendship. I think that Leslie can say, "Your friend of mine was there," and um, and uh, um, Mr. R. Um, so because she doesn't, Joyce doesn't respond straight away. But then Leslie carries on, Mr. R. And um, Joyce goes, "Oh yes." It's slightly mistranscribed there. I think it's more of an "Oh yes." Um, so they know, Joy, Leslie doesn't have to give many clues to who this Mr. R is. So then we get this very um, background detailing, don't we? Um, we really didn't have a lot of change that day because we'd been to Bath and we'd been Christmas shopping, but we thought we'd better go along to the sale and do what we could. We hadn't got sort of ready cash to spend. Now we were, we were talking about the fact that there's quite a lot of TCUs in that turn. It's a multi two so you turn. So there are various TRPs, but Joyce doesn't come in because one of the norms about storytelling is that if, if I indicate that I want to tell a story and you've given me the go-ahead, then I expect you to let me tell the story to, to give me a chance. So I would expect you know to take TRPs, to have TRPs, but not necessarily have you come in and say anything. Or even or if you do say anything, probably just minimal responses. Not to say that can't change, you know, it, change, it can change moment by moment, but, but that, that would be how you'd normally uh, expect things to work out. So we have these big turns um, with TCU, a pause, a little pause, maybe another TCU, another little pause, um, but Joyce not saying anything. And we get a little bit of response, um, just a mm, -hmm, mm -hmm, that's right, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, at 23, and then another TCU. In any case, we think we've got things that are very expensive. Uh, then you get, oh, did you? Which is interesting because it's packaged as a question, isn't it? Grammatically, it looks like a question, but Leslie doesn't treat it as a question. She doesn't say, um, oh, we did actually, yes. And it, it could have veered off the storytelling at some point. This is one of those occasions where you could have got. Um, um, uh, uh, movement out of storytelling and then perhaps back into storytelling later. So you could have got Joyce, um, you could have got Leslie saying, "Yes, actually, I saw, I saw a fruitcake for eight pounds. I couldn't believe it." You know, you could have got that sort of thing, um, but you don't. So Leslie doesn't treat this as a question. She carries on with those detailing, um, <coughs> and we were looking around the stalls and poking about. And she came up to me. He, sorry, he came up to me and he said. Oh, hello, Leslie, still trying to buy something for nothing. So that's where you get the direct reported speech. You get her um, claiming, if you like, to, to, to reenact Mr. R's words, to, to play Mr. R's words, to, to say it as he said it at the time. Okay, so that's direct, direct quotation, direct reported speech. Um, You'll notice one of the things that's interesting about that, I think, is that um, it's very granular. She, 
Chekhov talks about granularity. Um, that's when something that's very granular, very fine-grained. Um, you know, we can t we can tell stories in a lot of detail, or we can just give a general gloss. So Leslie could have said, uh, "Well, we went to the sale at the vicarage, uh, but I didn't have much money to spend. But Mr. R came up to me and he he said, blah blah blah." Um, the detailing, there's a lot of detail there, isn't it? You know, as we were looking around stores, we were poking about. It's a bit like, you know, one of those films when you, it's shown in great detail, you know, you get all the information, you get, you get the camera following the characters for a lot of time, seeing all their movements. Um, often you, you know something's going to happen because, you know, they just, you know, they make a cup of something you kind of know that something's going to happen because you're getting a lot of granularity to the, to the footage. Um, so her description is very granular. And all that last bit, all the last bits is very, very granular. She's kind of zoomed in, hasn't she? She's gone, well, we've been to Bath, and then, but then you get to Vicarage, and she goes through it in a lot of detail. It's very granular. And that leads up to the reporter's speech. Oh, hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing. Okay, which again is, is also very granular. So th that's the climax of the story. That's what she's worrying about, isn't it? That's, that links back to the professor who says, this is what I'm boiling about, he was rude to me, this is what he said. Now, as I say, interestingly, up to this point, you haven't got much detail about how Leslie feels. You haven't got to say things like, you know, oh, well, he, he came up to me and he said something really rude. He said, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't get those kinds of um, direct assessments. You get, it's much more kind of objective. I don't think it really is, but it, it, it appears to be very objective with Leslie saying, you know, this happened, we've been to Bath, we went to the sale, we were looking around stores, and he came up to me and he said, it claims to be quite objective, it's just saying what happened. So you don't get a lot of assessment up to that point. But then things change, don't you? You go into a very different sequence, you get Le Joyce's response. So the storytelling's finished, and we get the response sequence. And you get a lot of overlap, don't you? The turn taking is very different in this bit because here you get a lot of collaboration. You get them both doing the same things at the same time. So you get them collaborating to do this kind of response to the, to the telling, to what the person's told to Joyce. So you first of all get this, oh, they're both kind of doing this, you know, shocked in breath. And then Joyce goes, ooh, and Leslie goes, ooh, in overlap. So again, same thing at the same time, lovely collaboration. And then Leslie laughs, and then you get Joyce doing, but isn't he? And say it again, Leslie overlapping with what do you, what do you say? Again, that's interesting, we were saying, because that's, grammatically it looks like a question, but it's not, um, and, uh, and Leslie doesn't uh, treat it as such. Um, it's not, oh, what, what, do you, what do you say? Leslie doesn't say, yes, I know, what do you say? Or, or um, well, you say, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Leslie just agrees, yes, what an awful man. So you get these assessments, you get the laughter. Um, uh, again, Joyce, uh, very strong assessment. Honestly, I can't stand the man. So it's, interestingly, it's Joyce is doing the negative assessments, mostly. You know, she, what an awful man. You know, oh, well, oh, isn't he dreadful? What an awful man. Oh, honestly, I can't stand the man. So you get three very strong negative assessments from, from Joyce. Which is interesting, is to say you haven't really had that from Leslie, and yet she's the one telling the story about this terrible thing. All she said really is, I'm broiling about something, which is very vague. So, one of the things that we can notice about storytelling is that it kind of um, allows the recipient to kind of experience what you're talking about. And I think reported speech is very, very important in that. And then the recipient can kind of do the, do the response. Um, so that's, that seems to be some, one aspect of, of reported speech, is it allows, the, allows you to kind of say what happened, to say it in a very granular way, you know, this happened, that happened, that happened. He said X, Y, and Z. And then the recipient can 
go, oh, that's terrible. You know, they can respond, they can assess it for you. Uh, so that's an important aspect of it. So what I'd like to do now, what we do with conversation analysis, we usually begin with a single case. You, you go through, you look at a single case in as much detail as possible. But very important to conversation analysis is working with collections. Because as I said, what ultimately what you're after is these patterns. And of course you can only tell what's a pattern if you have more than one instance. To, to know that it's a pattern, you have to have a collection. So, for example, when Shegloff was studying openings to, cl to conversations, he looked at telephone call openings. He had 500 examples, um, and it was and it was the 499th that kind of led him to, to the analysis that he came up with in the end. So we work with collections, um, and as much as possible, I've tried to give you collections to work with you over this uh, two days. So, what I'd like to just do quite quickly is look at another example of a storytelling with reported speech. It's not quite as neat as the one we've just looked at. Um, that's a really nice, neat, neat storytelling. This one's not quite as neat, so I've not been able to give you quite as bit as much. It goes on for a very long time, so I didn't want to look at all that. We have, it's, the response is not as good. Joyce is a fantastic recipient in here, but uh, with the next one, her Leslie's mum isn't, isn't such a good recipient. She doesn't give you know, such a good response as Joyce does. Um, however, what it does do is it gives us another example of a storytelling leading up to direct reporter speech. Another thing that we have here is a nice example of indirect reporter speech. So I want to have a look at that as well. So what I'd like to do is, again, focus very much on the the reporter speech. We, we can look at the reporter speech at the end of the storytelling and compare it with, with oh hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing. Um, we, oh, that's better. <laughs> oh, don't have to show. We can uh, we can compare it with that. There's also very at least one very nice example of indirect reporter speech in this this one, and that's something I'm going to set you homework. So. And that's what, uh, what I'm going to ask you to look at tonight is indirect reports of speech. So it leads on to that nicely. Um, so as I say, what I'd like to do is, uh, so this is extract number two. Um, it's about um, Leslie's husband, again it's Leslie and it's her, her talking to her mum. And Leslie's husband works for um, a company that makes agricultural equipment, you know, um, Tractor, well, not tractors so much, but the, th the things that go on the end, the back of tractors, plows and things like that. Um, and so to sell or to advertise what they do, they go to these big shows. They have these big agricultural shows. And so his company had gone to the show and taken um, a demonstration of the equipment they make. Okay, so, um, so he, she's talking about this show where the company have done um, a display of how their equipment can, um, she, she says it can plough up the rough land and make it good for cultivation. Okay. Um, and she talks about the fact that um, Prince Philip and the Queen are coming to the show, to open the show. Okay, so that Prince Philip and the Queen are going to go from stall to stall, and, uh, or um, display to display, and, and see what's on show. And um, so she talks about the fact that um, that Prince Philip is not in a good mood and she says he's had some kind of tiff tiff with the Queen. Do you do you know that it's an old fashioned word really tiff? It means a slight argument, a slight falling out. Um, so he's had a tiff with the Queen and then she talks about um, him going around the stalls and being rude. She says curt to everyone, which is being rude, being, being short with everyone, being you know, a uh, bit rude to everyone. Um, and then we'll see that her mum actually kind of interrupts the storytelling to say, um, well, he did that in China too. So it was well known many years ago that Prince Philip went to China and was rude in China. Um, so then uh, they talk about that very briefly. And that's where we get the indirect reporter speech happening. 
So she says, uh, uh, Mark said he's not surprised that he behaved like that. Um, so that's the indirect report speech. And then you get back to the story, carries on with the story, and um, he came to their store um, and he, uh, they showed him everything. So they showed him all the equipment and then um, he just um, said, well, you get the reported speech and what he said uh, and he just stole that. And then I'll play a little bit of the response, but as I say, the response is not great. Um, so you'll hear it, but uh, I haven't included it in the transcript there. Um, so what we're doing now is we've got, as I say, we've got three examples of reported speech, possibly more. You might see there's some sort of borderline ones in here as well. But we've got indirect report speech in the first example, uh, sorry, direct report speech that we've looked at in the first example, which is, oh, hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing, an extra one. Now we've got an indirect reported speech. Um, he came to the, um, sorry, Mark said he's not surprised that he behaved like that. And then we've got the direct reported speech, which is, ha, huh, making another desert, I see. So, we've got a little collection, a very small collection, two examples of direct reported speech. Um, and we can compare the two. And what I'd like to do is look at similarities, okay, look for patterns. So we can think about, does the direct reported speech occur in the same positions? Okay, is there a similarity between the direct report speech in the first ex extract it, um, and the second one? Okay, so does it occur in the same sorts of places? Um, does it occur, are they similar storytellings? Are they, are they is Leslie doing something similar with both these storytellings? Is it the same kind of environment? Okay. Then we can look at the direct report speech itself. Uh, is it designed in similar ways? So you've got her making another desert, I see, and uh, oh, hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing. Are there some similarities in the design of these? Are they doing similar things? Um, can we account for why, in both cases, Leslie uses direct report speech at this point in the storytelling? What does it do? What, what, why does she choose to do it in direct report speech? Okay. We can also, in the second one, say we can compare it with the indirect report speech. We've got this, um, and Mark said, uh, um, uh, he's not, um, 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 for Mark said he's not surprised that he behaved like that. So you've got also another, another way of analysing it is to think about what's the difference between the direct report speech and the indirect report speech. Does it happen at different places? Is it doing different things? Is it a different level of granularity? Okay, so that's another um, angle we can take to help us get a grip on particularly what the direct report speech is doing. Okay, so let me play it through a few times and then we'll work on that, okay? Um, so. And he went mood, and he went from stall to stall in a thunder. 
cloud. <laughs> and after he'd gone, they had to go around to the stallholders and apologise for him because he was curt to everybody. Um, yes, and um, Anthony is not surprised that he, that he behaved like that. And he came to their stall, Palmerston stall, and he, they showed him everything and he said, Puh, making another death, I see. And just stormed off. Okay, I'll play that one more time. And, and he went mood. And he went from stall to stall in a thundercloud. <laughs> and after he'd gone, they had to go around to the stallholders and apologise for him. Because he was curt to everybody. that we can compare. They both have direct reports of speech. Um, this one also has the indirect reports of speech of um, Mark said he's not surprised that he, he behaved like that. Um, so what I'd like to do is say is focus in on the direct report of speech and, and maybe compare it to the indirect report of speech as well. Look at does it happen at the same sorts of positions? Um, are they similar kinds of environments? You know, what's Leslie doing with these storytellings? Um, are they similar kinds of stories? Um, do they happen within the stories at the same points? How is the direct report speech designed? Are there similarities between these two examples? Um, and what what is she doing with the with the report speech in both cases? Okay, is that all right? Does that sound okay? And again, if you need to if you need to hear it, just give us a shout and I'll play it through again. Some time looking at examples like this, and I had a bigger collection. Obviously, I didn't just work on these two. I had a big collection of report speech and interaction. Lots of uh, Phone, mainly phone calls, but other other types of interaction, and I went through and I looked at various types of uh, direct report speech and various positions where the direct report speech occurred. So what I'd like to do is share some of those findings that I made with you as we talk about these two examples uh, specifically. Okay. So, and again, what I'm trying to do is show you the sorts of the sorts of things that CA can tell us, the sorts of findings that you can come up with using a CA methodology. Okay, so, um, so as I say, we have a very small collection here. We have two stories with direct report speech. Um, so what I'd like to do is, um, as I say, I think you can kind of separate your observations roughly into um, about the overall kind of sequence or structure or context um, and then the design of the turn specifically. So we'll try and separate it in those two ways. So, so first of all, um, if we have like um, structure or uh, um, sort of sequence. Okay, what can we say about these um, the, these, the overall sequences, how, how the direct report speech in both examples fits into the overall talk. Okay, what, what can we say very broadly, starting off very broadly and simply, what, what, what is the environment? What, where, where is the direct report speech occurring? Okay, in a, in a general kind of way. I've said they're storytelling, haven't I? So that's clearly, they're both storytellings. What? Sorry. Yes, exactly. Yes. So we're getting them in um, in stories, and they're both they're kind of happening at the climax or the end the end of the story. Okay. What else can we say about the overall kind of sequence? What type of stories are they? What 
all sorts of storytellings, are they? Reporting from event? Yes, they're reporting events, aren't they? Both telling stories about events, things that have happened. And what's, what's Leslie doing with that, those kinds of... By talking about these events, what is she doing most specifically? She's not just you know, simply describing what happened. She's kind of doing a bit more than that as well. Sorry? Reporting. Reporting, yeah, she's reporting um, things that happened, yeah, events, and, and obviously we get all that fine grain kind of detailing, don't we, about the things that happened. Um, what, um, what about the men in the stories? She, you know, they're both about men, they happen to be about men, uh, Mr. R and Prince Philip. What's she doing, um, what's her attitude, shall we say, towards the men? Negative. Negative attitude, yeah, yeah. Basically, um, they're, they're complaints, aren't they? They're, um, or criticism, they're, um, in both, in both cases, she's, she's complaining, she's telling negative stories about what third parties have done. Okay, she's not telling stories about, um, you know, she's not talking about things that have involved Leslie or, uh, sorry, Joyce or her mum. She's reporting things that have happened, telling them about things that they've happened that they weren't party to. In both cases, it's reporting the speech of a third party um, in the context of complaining about this third party. And, and that's important because it turns out that direct reported speech is quite common in complaints. Um, Paul Drew's done some work on this. Um, a lot of the conversations that I looked at, a lot of the storytellings, where, the, where you got the direct reported speech, quite often it was in complaints. So, so we can say something about the environment, um, the sort of overall um, conversation environment um, is that they often tend to, to occur in complaints. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's turn now to the. Um, there's probably more to say to that. We can come back to that. I'm sure other things will, will occur uh, as we go through, but it's difficult to separate all these things out. But how about the design of the direct report speech? itself, because I think there's an awful lot we can say about that. So these, I'm particularly focusing now on, oh hello Leslie, still trying to buy something for nothing, and ha, huh, making another desert I see. What, what can we say about those two? Are there any similarities in design? Kind of portraying the men involved, the, the report, the person she's reporting as. Um, well, it, it, yeah, it gives a very specific kind of little little picture of them in both in both cases, doesn't it? So when she says, you know, oh hello, oh, oh hello, Leslie, still trying to buy something for nothing, you get this idea of this kind of perhaps dismissive, rather haut haughty kind of man, <laughs> you know, being very patronising, you know, and being rude and patronising, saying, you know, are you, are you still, are you trying to, are you, you're at this charity fair and you're trying to um, get something for nothing, you're trying to, um, you know, save your money and it's a charity event, a vicarage fair. Um, and, and in the other one, yes, ha, huh, making another desert, I see. Again, you get a very sort of particular image of Prince Philip at that point, don't you? Being him being rude, being again being haughty, actually, strangely enough, isn't it? There's a nice, <laughs> nice echo there um, of being being rude, being patronising, uh, being dismissive. Um, so yes, in both cases, you get you get a little glimpse of of these characters that she's talking about, of Mr. R and Prince Philip. Now that's obviously. One of the things that direct report speech can do is it can give us these little snapshots because um, one of the things we do obviously in direct report speech is we shift footing. Have you come across the idea, Goffman's idea of shifting, shifting footing? Um, Goffman makes a distinction between when you're 
say, the author of something or when you're simply enacting it. Um, so when we shift footing, um, with direct report speech, we, we purport to be simply, simply re re repeating what someone else said, don't we? We're just, we're just replaying, so we're, we're sort of enacting, if you like. We're just simply reporting what someone else said. So that's obviously, that's a big difference between direct report speech and indirect report speech, isn't it? So when you get um, uh, Mark said he's not surprised that he behaved like that, she's not there claiming to shift footing to suggest that she's reporting Mark's actual words. What she doesn't do is say, like um, Mark said, oh, I'm not surprised that he behaved like that. So she's not shifting footing there to, to enact, simply enact the words. It's, it's indirect, not direct report speech. So with direct report speech, you enact the words. So she's purporting to just simply replay, play what Mr R said, what <coughs> Prince Philip said. Um, so there are various results of that. One is um, that by claiming to just reproduce what someone said, you're giving evidence of, of it, you're, you're supplying evidence of what someone said. So um, by saying, you know, oh, oh hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing, or um, ha, making another desert, I see, you're suggesting that this is what they actually said. Now that's very important, and I, I've said in one of my papers, I called it access. I called it giving access to it. Um, and this links to this issue of it being in complaints, because obviously if you're complaining about someone, then it's helpful to give evidence to to show yourself as objective, as you're, you're simply saying what happened. You're replaying what happened. You're being objective about it. And of course, what that does is it allows the, allows the recipient to kind of see it for themselves. Um, experience it for themselves. Now this is important because um, studies have shown that direct report speech is rarely accurate. We cannot remember utterances in enough detail to replay them as they were actually said. So although we tend to treat direct report speech as an accurate rendition of what someone said, it's not. So this is, is very interesting, and obviously Deborah Town talks about it as, as um, oh. constructive dialogue, uh, because um, she, you know it's recognised that it's not actually accurately re replaying what was said. So it allows the recipient to experience it for themselves. Now this links nicely with the connection we, with what we were saying about the way Leslie tells the stories, um, and we said this with the first story that she does it in quite an objective way. No, um, just telling those details, you know, first of all saying I'm broiling about something, uh, but then going into just detail, 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 and this is what he said, and then it's Joyce that goes, oh, that's terrible, you know. So um, what, what Leslie's done is just kind of replayed what happened, and then it gives Joyce the chance to assess it, and it's Joyce that assesses it, and says, oh, what a dreadful man. So it allows you to just seem to be very objective, just saying what happened. You don't say, you know, oh, he was, he's dreadfully, he's so rude, he said blah, blah, blah. You just say, this is what happened, and then your recipient can go, oh, that's terrible. Okay, so that's one of the things that reporter speech is very good at. And I've got this lovely call in my collection where it's between 
teenage friends, and um, it's an American call. Um, she goes on at great length to her friend about the fact that an ex-boyfriend has wrung her and had this long conversation with her. And what she does all the way through, she just says, and he rung me, and he said this, and he said that, and, he, and she just reports what happened. And then at the end, the friend says, oh, well, he clearly wants to get back together with you. And that's obviously what she was going for. She wanted to know, you know, she, she obviously felt, you know, he wanted to get back together with her. But she's not going to say that. She's going to just report what happened and then let the friend say, you know, clearly he wants to get back. So it's a very powerful device in terms of just, you put it out there, you enact what people said, and then they can make their own minds up, as it were. But it's not really as objective as it appears to be. Um, so that's one... Um, a uh, very interesting aspect of the design and um, summarising what someone said. You know, it's direct report of speech is what allows you to shift footing to, to purport to be simply replaying what someone said. Okay, what about the design? Did you notice anything about the way that it's actually put together? You know, in one you've got, he said, oh, hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing. In the other one you've got, he said, ha, huh, making another desert, I see. What can we say about the way that these are actually constructed? Both with direct report speech and indirect reported speech. So you've got the speech verb and the, uh, and, and the pronoun or, the, or a name plus the quotation. Um, one of the interesting things we can notice with these is obviously you get uh, at the beginning, um, in one you've got ha, and in the other you've got oh hello. Um, any ideas about what those might be doing? Why you've got ha huh, and oh hello? Sorry. Body starting uh, phrases. Uh, body starting sentences. Yeah, that's right. So it's that these are turn initials. They start things, don't they? Huh? Trying to make, trying to. Um, yeah. So um, beginning something. You often get also get things like well, which again is a starting, it's a way you start uh, a turn, you get lots of wells. So what they're doing is showing that, you know, this is the start of the direct reporter's speech. This is, I've shifted footing, I'm no longer talking as myself, I'm talking as that other person. Um, and we find these sorts of things, these turn initials, really common um, at the beginning of direct reporter's speech. So, well, uh, um, yeah, um, things like, uh, oh, well, things that are, are very regularly associated with beginnings of turns. So one of the things they do, obviously, is they indicate, right, this is reported speech now. The other thing it does is it gives, it gives an idea of the stance, doesn't it, and the, and the context. So, ha, huh, obviously, that gives quite an indication into principle of stance, doesn't it? Ha, huh, it's dismissive, it's rude, it's... Um, hoity, as we said, patronising, perhaps. Um, similarly, I think with oh hello, uh, it's not hello, it's oh hello. Uh, again, there's something kind of a bit hoity about that as well, haughty, perhaps. Um, bit dismissive. Um, so it indicates that she, he's just walked up to her, she was innocently looking around the stalls, he's walked up to her and he's gone, oh hello. And, you know, it's an unprovoked attack. <laughs> um, so those turn initials are very interesting because, the, as I say, they indicate something about how the direct report speech fits into the context. So, for example, if you get well at the start of, in, of direct report speech, you know that it's following something, that in the original, original situation, the, that this is a response to something. Um, if, it, if you get oh, then it suggests that some kind of change of state, heritage calls them, that you've undergone some kind of change of state. Um, so, uh, so those turn initials can be very useful in various ways of indicating, yes, this is direct report speech, and indicating something about the context and something maybe about the stance of the speaker as well. 
And then obviously in, in this one you've got, oh, hello, Leslie. Um, so again, that's very useful because it indicates, um, you know, this is Leslie talking. So it's Leslie saying, <laughs> you know, this is not my words, this is his words. Um, so again, it's a very clear indication that she's shifted footing. Um, the, another thing, of course, that's interesting about direct report speech is, is if you're claiming to simply be reenacting the words of someone else, you can shift your, you can change your intonation as well to indicate not only what was said but how it was said. So in both these, you've got nice examples of, you know, um, Leslie conveying a lot through the intonation, you know, huh, making another desert. I see. Oh, hello, Leslie. Still trying to buy something for nothing. That, particularly that emphasis on still, still trying to buy something for nothing. So again, you get an indication of the speaker's stance, or the reported speaker's stance, through the shift in intonation. And you can't, of course, do that with indirect reported speech, because you're not claiming to reenact the words with indirect reported speech. You're just simply saying what they said. But with direct reported speech, you can do that. You can do um, not only how it was said, uh, what was said, but how it was said as well. Okay, what else? Anyone notice anything else that I've not, not covered? Any other observations? Sorry, say that again. Yeah, you, so you, couldn't, you, you have enough information here to kind of fill in <coughs> Leslie poking around the stalls and him coming up and saying, oh, hello, Leslie's to a talk. You know, it's, we get a lot of information about how these ha things happened. So it's incredibly granular. And direct report of speech is very granular. Um, as I say, one of my interests at the moment is stand-up comedy, and that's in interesting because you get, say, you get lots of report of speech. Stand-up comedy is very granular, but it's often it's the reported speech in the stand-up comedy which is particularly granular. Um, yes, yeah, so direct report of speech. Another thing that is powerful about it is that it's, at, it ha it's at a very fine, fine level of detail. And again, that fits with our climax of the stories because as you go through the story, you get more granular and you go into detail, you zoom in and then you get the climax of the story and then you kind of zoom out again. It's the kind of thing that CA can tell us when you work with these collections and you look at the sequence and you look at the design, this is the sort of information that it can give us. Now, as I say, there's homework. Um, what I want to do is set um, a task carrying on looking at a report of speech, but this time indirect report of speech. So what I've done is in here, I've given you a little collection of examples of indirect report of speech. So this is from extracts three on page 14 to extract eight on 16, page 16. All these involve what I think is loosely termed indirect reported speech. Okay, so when you might disagree, you might think it's not exactly indirect reported speech because indirect reported speech I think is quite a fuzzy category, probably more so than direct reported speech. Um, because you get at the one end, you get these real sort of just losses of what happened. You know, we might have seen one of those that apparently he had some sort of tip of the queen, um, a gloss of what happened. But then you get these more prototypical indirect report of speech, like um, Mark said that he's not surprised that he, he behaved like that, where you could very easily translate that into direct report of speech. Mark said, I'm not surprised that he behaved like that, so just changing the pronoun would, would be enough. Um, so you may, you may not necessarily sort of um, agree that they are indirect report of speech, but I wanted to use the term quite loosely, okay? Uh, because in CA that's very common, you start off with quite a loose idea of what of the phenomenon that you're looking at and then you kind of try and tighten it as you go through. So, um, so I'll play you through these ex extracts, they're all in the data, so if you've, if you've been able to download the data, you've got, you can hear them, you'll be able to play them. I'll play them through anyway and I'll tell you where the indirect report speech is, or what I'm calling indirect report speech. And so what I'd like you to do is think about um, can we see a pattern to the indirect report of speech occurring? It, is there, um, can we describe, is there a pattern 
to the occurrence of the indirect water speech. Okay, so looking at the overall sequence, where does it happen? That's the first question, the big question. Then also we can focus in on the design of the indirect reported speech. How does it differ from the direct reported speech? It, um, is it designed differently? Think about things like the granularity of it. So those are the two things. It's looking at the sequence. Where does it fit in the sequence? Is there a pattern to that? Um, how is it designed? Is there, is there, are there patterns to that in this little collection? Can we say anything about how the indirect report speech is, is designed? Okay, so uh, that's, that'll be the homework task. Um, and then what we'd like to do is spend about the first hour when we come back tomorrow looking at that. Um, and if you could um, maybe um, together in groups of, um, what should we say, two or, two or three, um, perhaps in, in groups of two or three, report back uh, for about 10 minutes on what you found. Okay, is that all right? So do you, can you decide who, who you're going to work with together? Is it, do people have someone that they could work with? All right. Okay, so I want you, as I say, if you can get into groups of two or three and then report back for 10 minutes on the findings tomorrow morning at, after 11 o'clock. We can come back to that later if you like. I was just flagging it up now to so think about that and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, uh, what I'm going to do is just go through each extract and tell you where the indirect report speech is. Okay. Right, so the first one, <coughs> so this is extract number three on page 14. So the indirect report speech that I'm interested in is in lines seven and eight. And um, she called me on the phone to ask me if I'd help. And Emma's talking about a friend that's rung her up and asked for some help. Um, and Emma says, yes, basically, yes, I'll go with your help. But I'm giving a cocktail to my friends at the moment. So basically, I'll have to finish, finish giving, <laughs> seeing my, entertaining my friends, and then I'll come over and help. OK, so I'll just. Um, I'll play that through. So, okay. Oh yeah, I called after I got through dinner. I told Marty, I said, uh, 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 I helped her with all this, get these book work things. You know, I had to call back numbers and accounts for it. And uh, she called me on the phone and asked me if I'd help her. You know, Bill Bryce were here, and I said, "Sure, I'll be down. I, I, I'll give them a cocktail now. They're going out to dinner, so oh, no, don't don't rush." But I said, uh, "I'll be down to help." Okay, so what's happened is uh, Emma's talking about having um, helped her friend with some book work. Um, so she talks about that. She's been helping her friend with book work, book work, and then then she kind of goes back in time. She says. Um, uh, she called me on the phone to ask if I'd help her. So this is before she went down to help her friend to do the book work. She's, she's, she's done a little switch there back in time. Um, so she called me on the phone to ask me if I'd help her. So this is her friend Margie ringing her and saying, um, you know, can you come down and help me? And then, and, and Emma says, uh, you know, uh, when, so, so Margie rang when Bill and Gladys were here. So she was entertaining her friends, Bill and Gladys. Um, Margie rang, asked her to come and help her. So she said, um, I said, sure, I'll be down. I'm, uh, I'm giving them a cocktail now. Then they're going out to dinner. And she said, oh, now don't rush. But I said, I'll be down to help. So the indirect report of speech is, say, is lines seven and eight. So she called me on the phone to ask me if I'd help her. As I say, this is a bit, this is one of these kind of slightly borderline ones as to whether it's just a sort of gloss or summary of what was said. Um, or is it, is it, it's not perhaps so prototypical in direct report speech. Anyway, but that's, that's the term I'd like to look at. Uh, okay, the next one, um, oh, Leslie's telling a long story about 
a husband she knows, someone who, well, someone, she's heard the story about a husband who got very, very drunk and disappeared and um, kind of, yeah, disappeared one night, didn't come home, and so the wife, Lynn, was ringing up trying to find out where her husband had gone. So Leslie's telling this story about Lynn trying to, to track down her husband. Um, so here, the turn that I'd like to look at is um, in line uh, seven, in number seven. Lynn, uh, well, Lynn rang up this fellow and said, was Duncan with him? So this fellow is, is, her, is Lynn's husband's friend. Uh, so Duncan is, is the husband's friend. So basically, so the wife is ringing up the husband's friend to, to find out where, where the husband is. Okay, so I'll play that to her. Oh, what's his wife's name? Good. Good. Well, Lynn rang up this fellow and said, uh, was Barry with him? It's about midnight. Was Barry with him because he hadn't come home yet? And he said, no, I haven't seen him all evening. And she said, well, coming down, I said, well, then I'm going to leave because after all, I can see you any time and we don't have a lot of things to talk about. She said, no, I don't want you to leave. Uh, that's the reason I didn't call you at work. Okay, so in this one, um, she's talking about going to visit a friend of hers um, and finding that the friend has already got some visitors coming, okay? So she, she's, she's going to visit her friend, um, uh, Helen, uh, I think there's two Helens here, there's Helen and Helen Fretwell. Um, so she's going to visit her friend and then she, she finds out that, that her friend is going to be visited by these people because they're going to take a trip together and they've got paperwork to do for the trip. Okay, so, um, so when she gets there, she hit, the friend says, you know, I've got these people coming to visit me. And obviously she says, oh, I'm going to go. And the, and the friend says, no, don't go. So I'll just play that again. Very nice, so that Helen Fretwell could fill out the form and give Bruce a check and all for this trip she decided to take with him. So when I got there, she said, well, they were coming down. I said, well, then I'm going to leave because after all, I can see you any time and we don't have a lot of things to talk about. She said, no, I don't want you to leave. Uh, that's the reason I didn't call you at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the next one, which is... Uh, well, that's really straightforward, I think. The, the, the turn that I'm interested in particularly is uh, she said her friend had uh, had it taken off, uh, had, uh, sorry, uh, had her nail taken off. That's of. It doesn't look like it the way it's spelled on line five. But So we're looking at basically um, lines sort of three to five. Um, I spoke to my sister. Uh, she said her friend had it taken, uh, uh, had her nail taken off. So indirect, indirectly reporting what her sister said. So I'll just play that. So I talked to my sister yesterday, and she said her friend had it taken, had her nail taken off. She's my God, I never suffered so. You know, it's no fun to have a thing cut out. Oh, of course not. Okay, just play that again. So I talked to my sister yesterday, and she said her friend had it taken, had her nail taken off. She said, "My God, I never suffered so. You know, it's no fun to have a thing cut out." No, of course not. <coughs> okay, another one. Um, so th this is um, Emma talking um, to her sister about having um, Barbara is uh, Emma's um, daughter, and. Um, Basically, Emma and her husband have had a row, and he's gone off and left her. And um, so she's telling her daughter about this problem, and she's reporting this to her, her sister Lottie. Um, and the turn that we're interested in uh, is, uh, so I just called Barbara, and I told her, I said we'd have a problem. Okay, I'll that. So I just called Barbara and I told her that we'd had a problem, Barbara, and I don't know whether your father's going to be down here, and I'm awfully upset. And in the, when he called me, or I called him the other night. Yeah. Okay, let's play that again. So I just called Barbara and I told her that we'd had a problem, Barbara, and I don't know whether your father's going to be down here, and I'm awfully upset. And in the, when he called me, 
or I called him the other night. Yeah. Okay, and the last one, there's a lot here. You might not get a chance to look at all of these, and that's fine. Um, uh, number eight is um, Hal is talking about buying uh, tickets to a station and getting the name of the station wrong because he pronounces it like a town near where he lives. But this is, this is somewhere else with the same spelling, but it's pronounced differently. Okay, so he gets, he gets the pronunciation wrong. He pronounces it like the one near where he lives. Okay, so that, again, the term we're interested in is, I said I wanted two to Gillen, lines 14 and 15. So I just called Barbara and I told her that we'd had a problem, Barbara, and I don't know if your father's going to... Okay. And when I came back to Canterbury Station and had to get a ticket, I said, I, I said I wanted you to kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Yeah. And so he said, where the devil are you? <laughs> Someone said, he said, I thought we <laughs> We call it kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Great laugh, isn't he? <laughs> I love how I could listen to him all the time. Okay, I'll just play that again. And when I came back to Canterbury Station and had to get a ticket, I said, I, I said I wanted two to kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Yeah. And so he said, where the devil are you? <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, he said, I thought we <laughs> We call it kill him. That's such a Okay, so, um, so basically what we've got here is a, say, a collection um, of uh, instances which, e in each case, I think there's some kind of loosely termed indirect reported speech. And I think there's a fairly clear pattern here, so hopefully that will emerge very quickly. So it, I know it's a lot of data really to deal with in a short time, um, but hopefully there, there is a pattern that will emerge fairly quickly of of where the direct, indirect report speech is being used. And then if you get a chance, you can think about why it's being used and say the design, how does it compare with direct report of speech? You know, why, why do the speakers choose indirect report speech here, not direct report of speech, okay? Can we, can we find any reasons for that? Um, okay, and, and as I say, looking at the sequence, and is it, can we say so anything about the places where the indirect report speech occurs? Is it, is it in similar kinds of sequences or similar kinds of positions within the sequences? Okay, so as I said, that's your homework. Um, and we will revisit that tomorrow morning um, when we reconvene after 11 o'clock. Um, and so what we'd like to do is start with um, short presentations, 10 minute presentations about what you found. So if you can work on it, get together with someone tonight, tomorrow morning, um, before the session starts, and um, decide um, what your findings are and report back to the group first thing tomorrow morning. Okay, but, uh, so I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Or... What we have is a slight uh, change in the schedule. So uh, we start the session at 11, not at uh, not at 10. Okay, since you have homework and you may need some time to work. Uh, but uh, if you are staying together, you could work in your hostel or whatever place you are staying uh, tonight itself. Otherwise, you could come tomorrow morning, say at 9. Uh, you could assemble here, the room will be open. You could sit here for two hours and work work it out and do the presentations. Okay, does that sound okay? We'll officially start at eleven. Okay then.